Little saints, what a blessing it is to be here, isn't it? Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit's in this place. He's very merciful, isn't he? Our creator. Boy, he loves us. Boy, he loves us so much. You know, God's ordained gatherings like this for a mighty outpouring of his Holy Spirit, hasn't he? That's right. And we come. We come expecting the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, don't we? Not because we deserve it, but because He's so good. Because He loves us and He's promised us the gift of the Spirit. And He wants to teach us and guide us into all truth, doesn't He? He sure does. A lot of deception in the world today, isn't there? That's right. And Earth's history is wrapping up before our very eyes, isn't it? It sure is. You know, when I was uh, asked to speak today about preparing for Christ's second coming, What a topic. And I mean one hour. <laughs> what a topic. Has God given us light on how to be prepared for Christ's second coming in His Word? Yes. He has. Has He given us beautiful instruction in the spirit of prophecy on this issue? He sure has. But you know, God is looking for us to be unified in the faith on preparation for Christ's second coming. And he wants us unified that we ourselves may be prepared, but he also wants us to be able to take this everlasting gospel and do a work in preparing hearts around us that are within our sphere of influence as he ministers to these hearts through these feeble vessels. Is that right? It is. It is. And the theme has been relating to missionary work, medical missionary work, and being doers of God's word in the new covenant sense. That's the only real sense, isn't it? Amen. Amen. And so, you know, today's message was inspired by some of the conversations that some of us have had today. And I believe that if we can grasp something very foundational here, it will give us a launch pad to move forward together in unity in true medical missionary work and the value of it at this time in Earth's history. Because medical missionary work came about as a consequence of Christ's righteousness and his final message that he is giving to the world at this time. And so we want to study this in the light of the gospel, in the light of the atonement, as it relates to the congregation's duty at this time in earth's history. So let's open with another word of prayer as we move forward together. Father in heaven, we come before thy righteous and holy throne on this the Sabbath of the Lord. And we come before you because you are our God. We love you because of your character, because of who you are. And we thank you for creating us for such a time as this. Lord, we believe with all of our hearts that Jesus is coming soon. And we believe that you have ordained a work in being prepared for that blessed hope of the return of our Savior. And so today as we open the word of God, as we read the spirit of prophecy, as we discuss things, as we unfold things, we're asking for a mighty outpouring of your Holy Spirit to come and teach us and guide us into righteousness and truth on this subject. For Lord, every precious soul in here was bought with an infinite price. And it's your will that all of us be prepared for Christ's coming. Teach us now, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen, saints. I want to read you a few quotes. I didn't have time to put them on the slide. But these are very important quotes. And I think that we would do well to consider them as we move forward. This is from Councils on Diet and Food, page 75. And it reads, The Lord has given instruction that the gospel is to be carried forward. And the gospel includes health reform in all its phases. Interesting quote, isn't it? That the gospel includes health reform in all its phases. So if we are gonna be people that bring the everlasting gospel to the world, 
Is it essential that we begin to understand health reform in all its phases as we are embracing the everlasting gospel and sharing the everlasting gospel to prepare people for Christ's second coming? Is it essential? It sure is. Here we read in Evangelism 537, the conversion of souls is the one great object to be sought for in our medical institutions. The one great object, the conversions of souls. It is for this that these institutions are established. The sick and the afflicted coming to our sanitariums are brought within reach of the gospel workers laboring there. Amen. Amen. Oh, what precious opportunities are thus offered to sow the seeds of truth. Is that what Jesus did when he met the sick, the afflicted, the hurting? That's what he did. Let the spiritual atmosphere of these institutions be such that men and women who are brought to the sanitariums to receive treatment for their bodily ills shall learn the lesson that their diseased souls need healing. Amen. Is that every one of us? Is that everyone out there? Every single one out there. God has risen up this message for a purpose, and that is to deliver the sin sick soul from sin. I'd like to read to you one more quote here. This is from Councils on Health, page 31. The Lord is not pleased with ignorance in regard to his laws. Has God given what we need in this world, in this life, to not be in ignorance of his laws? He has, right? Are his laws good? Are they holy? Are they righteous? Are they eternal? The Lord is not pleased with ignorance in regard to his laws, either natural or spiritual. We are to be workers together with God for the restoration of health to the body as well as to the soul. Very powerful. And we should teach others how to preserve and to recover health. Praise the Lord. For the sick, we should use the remedies which God has provided in nature. And we should point them to him who alone can restore. What is this work about? Pointing people to who? To Jesus. That's our commission as medical missionaries. Pointing people to the great physician who has never lost a case to prepare them for his second coming. And here it says, it is our work to present the sick and suffering to Christ in the arms of our faith. Look at that beautiful principle. Labor is together with God. We will, in the arms of our faith, present these beautiful souls that Jesus emptied out of heaven for, that he laid down his life on the cross for. To him, what a privilege we have as medical missionaries, ministers of the gospel, to exercise Christ's faith in presenting these beautiful, precious children of God to him in our arms. We should teach them to believe in the great healer. We should lay hold on his promise and pray for the manifestation of his power. You know that's what does the healing, don't you? Bodily and in the soul. The very essence of the gospel is restoration. Mm. Let that one sink in. The very essence of the gospel is restoration. And the Savior would have us bid the sick, the hopeless, and the afflicted take hold upon his strength. The power of love. The power of what? Love. Of love was in all Christ's healing. And only by partaking of that love. What kind of love is that, by the way? Agape love from heaven, only by partaking of that love through faith can we be instruments for his work. If we neglect to link ourselves in divine connection with Christ, friends, this is vitally important. We're not safe for one moment outside of abiding in Christ. Not for a moment. 
And if we neglect to link ourselves in divine connection with Christ, the current of life-giving energy cannot flow in rich streams from us to the people. There were places where the Savior himself could not do many mighty works. Imagine that. Why? Because of their unbelief. So now unbelief separates the church from her divine helper. Her hold upon eternal realities is weak. By her lack of faith, God is disappointed and robbed of his glory. You know, I'm thankful for sobering realities that Jesus gives us in his testimony. Because God wants to rock us out of carnal security and Laodiceanism. So sometimes he tells us sobering realities, doesn't he? Is it loving for him to do that? Yes. Is he doing it to slap us around? Is he doing it so that we might respond to his agape love and partake of the divine nature? That's right. That's right. So I praise the Lord for how he's willing to work with us and admonish us on these points. Now we're going to turn this slide on here. Okay. One manuscript release, 228, we read. Our sanitariums have been established for the purpose of preparing a people for the second coming of our Lord and Savior. What's the purpose of our sanitariums? To prepare people for Christ's second coming, right? We're talking about being prepared for Christ's second coming now. God has ordained something and he says our sanitariums have been established for that specific purpose. So as time goes on and we believe that Christ is coming, what should we be establishing more and more of? What should we be embracing more and more of? Medical missionary work, the health message. Should we be sweeping it more and more out of the way? Should we be tucking it more and more under the rug? Should we be warring against that message? Or should we be embracing it to prepare people for Christ's second coming? Now, here's the thing. Seventh-day Adventists have been risen up for a peculiar and specific purpose. We're not better than anybody else. We're not better than any other denomination. We know that, right? We're not better than anybody else. We're all sinners. We're in the same boat with everybody else in the world in need of a savior. However, for this time in earth's history, God has given Seventh-day Adventists a specific message, a peculiar message to prepare people for Christ's second coming. Pastor Tony alluded to that as we looked in Revelation chapter 14, starting in verse 14, going to verse 16, that there was Christ's second coming. And just prior to that, we see the three angels messages being given. This is the only body in the world given the three angels messages. We're no better than anybody. But this is a message for this time in Earth's history. And as people hear that message, what do they do? They come into the ranks to be part of finishing the work. And included in that message is medical missionary work, isn't it? First angel's message has it in it. Second angel's message has it in it. Third angel's message has it in it. It's in all of them. We don't have time to go through that today, but it's very beautiful. Now I wanna ask you a question. In our view of the plan of salvation, which is a biblical view. In our view of the plan of salvation, is how we prepare people for Christ's second coming going to differ than maybe some other communions of faith around the world? Is it? it certainly is, right? It certainly is. Let's take a look here. First manuscript release, 228 reads, God's purpose in giving the third angel's message to the world is to prepare a people to stand true to him during the investigative judgment. Mm, what a term, the investigative judgment. You see, if people are going to be prepared for Christ's second coming, first, they must be prepared to stand true to God in the investigative judgment. Any human being who is not standing true to God when probation closes will not be prepared for Christ's second coming. So God has risen us up to prepare people for Christ's second coming and given us a message that is specific to prepare people to stand true to God in the investigative judgment. Does that make sense? So will we have some peculiarities on what is involved in being prepared for Christ's second coming? Yes or no? Yes. We will. And it is centered in our view of atonement. That's what it's centered in. That's where medical missionary work comes from. And we may, for the sake of time, boy, I better keep a watch here what time we have. We may, for the sake of time here, super fast, 
Like if I had a 100 page book, I'm just gonna read you a paragraph, okay? <laughs> Super fast look at the sanctuary. Because we should be generally well familiar with this. And let me tell you, if you're not familiar with this, this message will blow your mind. This message has some of the greatest truths ever entrusted to mortals within it. It is so powerful. And it reveals the fullness of the plan of salvation. Beautiful, beautiful message. And so here, we have a diagram. Again, very crude, very simple diagram of what the sanctuary is looked like. And here we have some articles of furniture. The altar of sacrifice. This is where a lamb was sacrificed. We have a laver of washing. We have a table of showbread. We have a seven branch candlestick. We have an altar of incense. We have an ark of the covenant. Those are articles of furniture within the sanctuary. Here we have something called the courtyard. Here we have the holy place. Here we have the most holy place. By the way, inside that Ark of the Covenant were the Ten Commandments. This represents the throne of God, right? And so what would happen here in the sanctuary service? The sinner, the repentant sinner, would come and he would bring a spotless lamb, right? He would lay his hands on the head of that lamb that was now going to be the sinner's substitute, right? And this is all a small example of a greater reality. We call it a type and an anti-type, right? And the sinner would, would confess and forsake their sins on the head of the lamb, thus transferring the sin from the sinner unto the lamb. And the sinner would slit the throat of the lamb because it is that sinner's sin that brought the death to the lamb that represented their savior. And as they saw the light go out of the eyes of that lamb, they realized that the wages of sin is death. And sin is a very serious thing. Very serious thing. And the priest would take the blood that was, that was coming out from the lamb. Again, we're going super crude here and going into the holy place and would take that blood into the holy place and would sprinkle that blood on the horns of the altar and before the veil, thus transferring the record of sin from the sinner to the type of the Savior and bringing those sins in to be recorded in the sanctuary where God can now do something with those sins without hurting the sinner. Okay? All right? And this would happen each day. Sinners would come, they sacrifice a lamb, the record of sin would be transferred in, the record of sin would be transferred in, the record of sin would be transferred in. Let me just do this for you. Sinners coming, record of sin is now going in, 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 and it's going here and here, okay? That was something called the daily. Then there was one day a year, something called the day of atonement, also called the yearly, the yearly. And on this day, the priest would come in and the priest would make a sacrifice and the priest would go in here all the way through here, in, and then on that day, the priest, one day a year, would enter in behind the second veil and come right here before the Ark of the Covenant. It was the Day of Atonement. And what was that priest going to do? That priest was going to take that efficacious blood in type and take it and sprinkle it right here before the mercy seat and on the mercy seat. Okay? Now, who is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? Jesus. Jesus. So this represents Jesus, our sacrifice. Who is our high priest in the heavenly sanctuary? Jesus. Jesus. So this represents Jesus in his mediatorial work in making atonement. Okay, are we together? All right. And so now we see, if we're going to look at the anti-type or the reality, the spiritual reality that this foreshadowed, we're going to understand that here at the altar of sacrifice, it represented Jesus Christ coming to the cross, right? He came to this world. He laid down his life for us. He sacrificed himself at the altar of sacrifice in this earth at the cross. But then Hebrews chapter 8 tells us something about Jesus, that he ascended to heaven and now he's our what? Our high priest. And where did he enter into? He entered into the holy place in heaven. 
And there we see him standing before the seven branch candlestick in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we see him standing here. And you know, God has given us the science of salvation in such beauty, in such detail, right? Okay, and so now Jesus is doing this work called still the daily when he enters in. What year? What year was Christ sacrificed and what year did he cross the threshold here? 31 AD. 31 AD, Christ crossed the threshold right here into the holy place. But then the Bible talks about a time when the sanctuary would be cleansed, which is when the Day of Atonement would begin. What date does the Word of God reveal that Christ would enter into the most holy place? 1844. 1844. Okay. And so now, Jesus, our high priest, came, lived a perfect life, got the victory over every sin you could ever be tempted with, made the way of escape for you, and then took into the holy place for all of those who profess faith in his name as their personal savior. He will take your sin from you and he will take that record of sin and he will bring it right in here for a specific purpose. Because when the Day of Atonement was to come, the high priest, Jesus Christ, would cross the threshold into the most holy place and he would then take his efficacious blood, and he would then sprinkle it right above the broken law of God. Because sin is transgression of the law. And the wages of sin is death. And the law, in order to atone for your sin, the one who would be your substitute must be equal to or greater than the law. So the lawgiver himself would come and lay down his life for you. And the lawgiver himself would take his own blood and put it right above his own law that was broken by you. Why? That you may be atoned for, your sin may be atoned for at one minute. This is atonement. This is the plan of salvation. Now, I want to ask you a question. Is all of this important? Yes. Okay. Is that a different thing? That's a different thing. That's a different thing. This is what most of the world understands today. Is that complete? Okay, well hang on a second. How about that? Oh wait, how about, that? is that better? Oh, oh we wanna be aware of ditches, right? Okay, let's take a look at something here. The daily work of atonement, this is very important. We're going to understand medical missionary work and where it comes from and why it's important and why it is vitally important to prepare people for Christ's second coming now, okay? The daily work of atonement, Leviticus chapter 1 verse 4. Leviticus chapter 1 through Leviticus chapter 15 go through the daily work. Leviticus 16 shows the yearly work. Referring to the sinner, and he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Here we go. Praise the Lord. Amen. Without that, there's no hope. There's no hope. That's what makes anything else possible, including you breathing today. Including the food you ate today. Everything in this world that you have by the grace of God is made possible because the antitypical fulfillment of that. Now watch this, Leviticus 4 verse 20. We're only going to read the red words for the sake of time. This is talking about the priest now. And the priest shall make an atonement. Wait a minute, who's making atonement? The priest is making atonement. Let's take a look here, Leviticus 4 verse 26. And the priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. Who's making atonement now? The priest is doing what? Making atonement. There's the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, who lays down his life for atonement. And then the priest takes that efficacious blood in Jesus and he does a work of atonement. Very, very important. 
And so here we see in verse 31, in the priest shall make an atonement for him and it shall be forgiven him. Leviticus 5 verse 6, in the priest shall make an atonement for him concerning his sin. 5 verse 20, in the priest shall make an atonement for him for his sin which he hath sinned and it shall be forgiven him. Who's making atonement consistently in the daily? The priest is making atonement. 5.13, and the priest shall make an atonement for him as touching his sin that he hath sinned in one of these and it shall be forgiven him. 5.16, and the priest shall make an atonement with him with a ram of trespass offering and it shall be forgiven him. 6.7, and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord. Vitally important. If your priest is not making atonement, you do not have complete atonement. Very, very important concept. The world needs to understand this because if the world understands this, they'll be able to understand more fully what is necessary to prepare to stand in Christ's second coming. Now let's take a look here at the yearly work of atonement on the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16 verse 2. This is referring to the Day of Atonement. And the Lord said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times into the holy place. Now this is referring to the most holy place. But here, in context, they're now referring to it as the holy place, which is oftentimes done with the most holy place, within the veil before the mercy seat, which is upon the ark, that he die not, for I will appear in a cloud upon the mercy seat. That's in the most holy place. Leviticus 16, verse 17, red words only, referring to the priest again, and have made an atonement for himself and for his household, and for all the congregation of Israel. I'm going to read that whole verse. And there shall be no man in the tabernacle of the congregation when he goeth in to make atonement in the holy place until he come out and have made an atonement for himself and for his household and for all the congregation of Israel. Wait a minute. The day of atonement happened in one day. The entire Hebrew economy and year is centered around the plan of salvation. Every day the lambs were slain. Every day the priest is bringing the blood in for the record of sin. Day after day after day this is happening. Atonement is being made. Why is it now that on this one day there needs to be another atonement made on a specific day? Why is that? For all the congregation of Israel, weren't, weren't they atoned for yesterday? Watch this. Leviticus 16 verse 24, talking about the priest and make an atonement for himself and for the people. Leviticus 16, 33. And he shall make an atonement for the priest and for all the people of the congregation. Leviticus 16, 34. He may make an atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. He makes an atonement for all their sins when? Once a year. Very, very important. This is, are you ready? The final atonement. Can you remember that term? This is a term that used to be well known among God's remnant people. It's not so well known anymore. This is the final atonement. And when the understanding of the final atonement goes away, recognizing the value in things like medical missionary work goes away too. And so the devil would love to take the whole world and make them ignorant of the final atonement. Because if the final atonement doesn't happen according to the plan of salvation that God has given in the science of salvation, our sins are on us in the judgment. Okay, let's take a look here. 10 MR 157, when Christ the mediator, mediator burst the bands of the tomb and ascended on high to minister to man, he first entered the holy place where by virtue of his own sacrifice he made an offering for the sins of men. With intercession and pleadings he presented before God the prayers and repentance and faith of his people purified by the incense of his own merits. Here we have this right here. Okay, now let's take a look here. He next entered the most holy place. To do what? To make an atonement for the sins of the people. Is that what we saw in the Word of God, the type showed? That's what Jesus has done. Since 1844, he enters in with his own blood right there to the mercy seat to do what? To make an atonement for the sins of the people and to cleanse the sanctuary. Because the final atonement, the cleansing of the sanctuary, and the judgment were all synonymous. The work of each of those things took place on the same day. Okay? His work as high priest, look at this term, completes the divine plan of redemption. It completes the gospel. Is that important news? 
His work as high priest completes the divine plan of redemption by doing what? By making the final atonement for sin. The final atonement. The day of atonement. The hour of God's judgment. And at this time, there's a specific message to prepare people to stand in the investigative judgment, to be prepared for Christ's second coming. Let's take a look here, Leviticus 16.30. Why a final atonement? For on that day, the day of atonement, shall the priest make an atonement for you. Why? To cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. When Jesus comes in might and glory and power to this earth and the heaven rolls back as a scroll and you're standing there and saying, Lo, there's my God, we've waited for him. You will be clean in his sight from all your sins. In the cleansing of the sanctuary, there is a correlating work with cleansing you here on earth. That, when Christ comes, you can stand prepared for the coming of the king. Isn't that beautiful? It sure is. Let's take a look here. Great Controversy 489. The intercession of Christ in man's behalf in the sanctuary above is as essential. It's what? It's as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. Let that sink in. Let that sink in. Because friends, if somebody was to come up to you and try to lessen the value of the cross. Lessen the significance of the cross. Lessen the glory of the cross. You should be very concerned, shouldn't you? But Christ's intercession on man's behalf in the sanctuary above in the final atonement is as essential to the plan of salvation as was his death upon the cross. So if somebody comes up to you and tries to lessen the value of the final atonement, lessen the value of the investigative judgment, Lessen the value of this beautiful plan of salvation in Christ's atoning work today. You should be very concerned as well. Inevitably, by the way, I have found that those who do that really struggle with embracing true medical missionary work. I'm not saying that's universal. It's just been my experience. And I wonder why. Let's find out. By his death, he began. He did what? Began. So at the cross, he began that work, which after his ascension, he ascended to complete in heaven. Notice the work is not complete unless it's done in heaven. We must by faith enter within the veil, in, within the veil whether the forerunner is for us entered, Hebrews 6 verse 20. There the light from the cross of Calvary is reflected. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord for that. There we may gain a clearer insight into the mysteries of of redemption. That's the plan of salvation. When you follow Christ by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, you will gain clearer insight into the plan of salvation. And if you're going to take this everlasting gospel, this plan of salvation to the world to prepare people for Christ's second coming, we must first enter within the veil that we might have the clearer insight to the plan of salvation, that we might understand what is necessary to prepare people for Christ's second coming. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. The salvation of man is accomplished at an infinite expense to heaven. The sacrifice made is equal to the broadest demands of the broken law of God. Jesus has opened the way to the Father's throne. And through his mediation, the sincere desire of all who come to him in faith may be presented before God. Amen. Amen. Now we're going to understand something. Now that we understand that there's a final atonement taking place, Christ is in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, making this final atonement, not only was there instruction for the priest on the day of atonement, but there was also instruction for those who were his congregation or the children of Israel who were alive at the time when the priest was making the final atonement. Does that make sense? Yeah. Let's take a look at that. Because if that instruction is given, it is given to prepare people to stand in the judgment, to prepare people to experience what God has called them to experience in the everlasting gospel. And we must understand what our position, work, and duty is to be prepared for Christ's second coming. Leviticus 23. Leviticus 16 shows a priestly work. Leviticus 23 shows a congregational duty. We together? 
Leviticus 23, starting in verse 27, also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. The final atonement. It shall be, here's the first point, in holy convocation unto you. Okay, there's a duty. It's a holy convocation. Let's take a look here. And ye shall afflict your souls. Now, friends, we don't have time today. Mm. We do not have time today to go through all these things. But we're going to touch on afflicting the soul a little bit because it specifically relates to the health message and medical missionary work in preparation for Christ's second coming. This is the one that we're going to take a little look at for you to continue studying further, okay? You're to afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. That's another factor, by the way. Verse 28. And ye shall do no work in that same day. Why? For it is a day of atonement. To do what? To make an atonement for you before the Lord your God. There's our high priest today, what he's doing. And now he's doing this. So what are we to do? For whatsoever soul it be that shall not be afflicted, in that same day he shall be cut off from among his people. That was a type of the final judgment. Cut off from among his people. So we must understand about afflicting the soul on the day of atonement. Isn't that true? Did God give this for nothing? No, he gave it for a specific reason. Let's continue it here. Now we have the day of atonement we're talking about, but there were the seven feasts, right? The Passover, unleavened bread, the first fruits, Pentecost, trumpets, day of atonement, tabernacles. We call them all feast days, right? But were they all a time of feasting? No, the day of atonement was a fast. Very important. The literal day of atonement was a literal fast. And if they didn't engage in that literal fast, they were cut off from among God's people, representing a type of the final atonement. The antitypical day of atonement, there is an antitypical fast that God is calling all of his people to partake of that they may stand in the investigative judgment and not be cut off when the final test comes. Are we together? You know that final test is, is coming soon. Amen. We have a short time, brethren, to prepare for Christ's second coming. And we have a short time to prepare others for Christ's second coming. We have a message that God has ordained to be brought to the soul. We need to embrace it ourselves and take it to the world. God is merciful. He's waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of his character and his people. And when the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced in his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. He's, he's merciful. But friends, this thing is wrapping up. If, you're, if you understand prophecy, you know this thing is wrapping up. Let's take a look here. Day of Atonement was a feast. Let's take a look here. What it means to afflict the soul. Again, we're going to just read this verse, Leviticus 16, verse 32, talking about the Day of Atonement. It says, It shall be unto you a Sabbath of rest. And ye shall afflict your souls in the ninth day of the month at even, even from even unto even, shall ye celebrate your Sabbath. What does it mean to afflict the soul? Whenever God calls a people to afflict the soul, he inspires a prophet to tell the people what it looks like. Let's take a look here at what the Bible shows it looks like in Ezra chapter 8, verse 21. Then I, talking about Ezra, proclaimed a fast. What did he proclaim? A fast, a fast there at the river of Ahava. Why? that we might afflict ourselves before our God. They were there and they had to afflict their souls. And so the prophet of the Lord revealed to them, it's time for the fast now. Are we understanding? Let's take a look here. Leviticus 23, verse 27. Now, we don't have time to read all of this. In the Amplified Version of the Bible, we, we read here that instead of afflict the soul, it writes, afflict yourselves by fasting and penitence and humility. Verse 29. Any soul, whoever is not afflicted by fasting and penitence and humility on this day shall be cut off from among, among his people that they may not be included in the atonement made for them. Verse 32. You shall afflict yourselves by fasting in penitence and humility. The contemporary English version reads, everyone must go without eating. Verse 29, I will destroy anyone who refuses to go without eating. Verse 32, everyone must go without eating. It's a fast, right? Okay, let's take a look here. 
We see that there is a fourfold instruction for God's people on the Day of Atonement. Holy convocation, afflict your soul, offer an offering made by fire, and do no work. To afflict the soul in the strongs can literally be translated to depress appetites. Why is that? Why does God, on the Day of Atonement, during the final atonement, when he is there with the blood of sprinkling right there above the mercy seat to make the final atonement for his people, to do what? To cleanse you, call you to depress appetite. Why does he do that? Where is appetite seated? In the higher center or lower center? In the lower center. You know, when God created man, he created man with a higher center, the reason, judgment, and conscience. By the way, that's where we receive the seal of God, isn't it? In the forehead. And the lower center is where we have the fight, flight. You know, we have the appetite, among other things. And what happens there is the lower center sends a signal to the higher center. Like, for example, when somebody's struggling with quitting smoking, and we do a stop smoking clinic. One of the things that we say to them is if you want to stop smoking, we need to stop drinking the caffeine. Why do we say that? Because caffeine stimulates and emboldens the lower center. So that now, when the lower center, the appetite, sends a request to the higher center for a cigarette, even though the person has lung cancer, and their reason is telling them, I need to stop smoking, they have not been power empowered to stop smoking because they are indulging and empowering the lower center and it is overriding the reason, the judgment in the conscience. What are we saying here? We have to starve the lower passions to have victory over sin. You cannot indulge the lower passions and expect to have victory over sin. It doesn't work that way. Think of the dogs that are fighting. You starve this one and you feed this one and over time, who's gonna win? You starve this one and you feed this one. Over time, who's going to win? God is going to have a people that will lighten the world with the glory of God and receive his seal very soon. And so he raises up a message in the health message, in medical missionary work, as an anti-typical fast to prepare you to stand in the investigative judgment and be able to reflect his character fully. But we're only going to understand that if we understand the full atonement. Notice everybody who understands the atonement like this does not embrace true medical missionary work. It's once we have the light of the true everlasting gospel, the fullness of the atonement, that naturally as a natural consequence of the message of Christ's righteousness in the fullness of the gospel, medical missionary work and the health message emerges. We're going to find that out. From the Holy of Holies, here goes on the grand work of instruction. The angels of God are communicating to men. Christ officiates in the sanctuary. We do not follow him into the sanctuary as we should. Christ and angels work in the hearts of the children of men. The church above, united with the church below. Oh, right? We're talking about the heavenly intelligences, united with us here on earth, is warring the good warfare upon the earth. There must, is that a negotiable word? It's not. There must be a purifying of the soul here upon earth. Is that what we see in that fourfold instruction? That's what we see. Why must there be a purifying of the soul here upon earth at this time in earth's history? Because it's the day of atonement. It's the judgment hour. There must be a purifying of the soul here upon earth in harmony with Christ's cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven. Leviticus 16, Leviticus 23. That's what we're looking at. And this work is part of the work that God has ordained to accomplish that purpose. Godliness, sobriety, and consistency will characterize the life and example of every true Christian. The work which Christ is doing in the sanctuary above will engage the thoughts and be the burden of the conversation. Why? Because by faith he has entered into the sanctuary. Let's ask ourselves a question here. Are my thoughts engaged in the burden of them? in the conversation that I have based on the work which Christ is doing in the final atonement today. This is what God wants for us at this time. This is part of our minds being connected with the blood of sprinkling that Jesus is doing on the mercy seat for us right now in making the final atonement. Remember, we're sealed in our forehead while we still have free will. Is that right? Okay, let's take a look here. 
he is on earth, but his sympathies are in harmony with the work that Christ is doing in heaven. So we must understand the work that Christ is doing in heaven. Christ is cleansing the heavenly sanctuary from the sins of the people. And it is the work of all who are laborers together with God to be cleansing the sanctuary of the soul from everything that is offensive to him. Is he worth it? Yes. Friends, he is worth it. There's nothing in your heart that's offensive to Jesus that's worth holding on to. Behold your God on the cross. Look at the love of Jesus for you. What do you want to hold on that's offensive to him? What has he not done for you? What is he offering you that's not better than the things of this world? In every facet of life, Jesus has something better for us than what we're holding on to that's offensive to him. Great Controversy 488, those who would share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. The precious hours, that's what we're in control of right here, instead of being given a pleasure to display or to gain seeking, should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful study of the word of truth. The subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. We have some studying to do as a people, don't we? It's good that we recognize it, right? We all have some studying to do because we're talking about the everlasting gospel here. Let's take a look here. How many is the first word there? All, all need a knowledge for who? For themselves of the position and what? Work. Work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be what? Impossible, Impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time. That's not non-essential faith, friends. If you're going to stand in the investigative judgment, you must be able to exercise this essential faith. God's calling us to come to terms with this because soon he's going to have saints that are lightening the world with his glory, calling people out of Babylon, warning them about the mark of the beast. Is that right? Let's take a look here. We don't have time to go through this for the sake of time. Here's a description of, um, of the Millerite movement. And we're seeing here in this description of the Millerite movement, boy, we get a move, that they were not prepared for Christ's second coming. They thought he was coming to the earth. They didn't understand from the book of Daniel, from the book of Malachi and other places that he was rather going to the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, right? And so here it says, but the people were not ready to meet their Lord. There was still a work of preparation to be accomplished. Why? Because the final atonement had to go through. And what was going to happen when the final atonement had to go through? Light was to be given, directing their minds to the temple of God in heaven. And as they should by faith follow their high priest in his ministration there, what would happen? New duties would be revealed. Leviticus 23 antitypes would be revealed. Beautiful truths that we see when you come into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary would be revealed. You see the law of God. In the law of God, you see the Sabbath. You recognize it's the hour of God's judgment, so the dead are dead because they have to be judged still. With all sorts of powerful light comes when you follow Christ by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary, including afflicting of the soul. Right? Okay. We're going to do this one more thing because I heard the bell ring. And, uh, and we'll close. We'll close. Typology of Israel, literal Israel. We're going to take a look at just a few things here. When God was delivering a people from Egypt and taking them to Canaan, there were a few things that we can take a look at. We're not going to take a look at a lot of them, just four now. There was the Passover. And then he would give them manna. And then he would bring them to Sinai. And then he wanted to bring them into Canaan. Okay, what was the Passover for Israel? Israel sacrificed the lamb and they painted the doorposts and the lintel with the blood of the lamb. And they went into the house. They were sealed in the house by the blood of the lamb, so to speak. And the death angel came and it saw that house and it saw the blood of the lamb that they were sealed inside with and it said, that one is justified and passed over. 
The Passover was an experience of justification by faith for literal Israel. And then God gave them manna, his dietary prescription. Why would God give Israel a dietary prescription? What was their diet like when they were in Egypt? Were they putting things into their body that could embolden and excite and empower the lower center? God in his mercy was giving them a dietary prescription or a fast in order to prepare their mind to be in a right relationship for what he had for them next at Sinai, which was receiving the law. Bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. It was God's preparatory measure that he gave to the children of Israel to prepare them for what he had for them next. And then he wanted to enter them into the promised land. Okay, here we go. Literal Israel. We see justification by faith. God's dietary prescription, receiving the law, entering the promised land in that order. Spiritual Israel. Let's take a look at the antitype. 1844, God would cut his people out of this world with a mighty cleaver of truth. And the third angel's message began to sound in what year? 1844. And the third angel's message. I have been asked if the message of justification is the third angel's message. And I have answered it is the third angel's message in verity. The message of justification by faith emerges in 1844, as the third angel's message begins to sound, remember the prophet says, I've been writing about this for over 40 years. I've been teaching this. God has put it on my heart to teach this same message for over 40 years. And then, if we're going to follow the type, what would we expect God to do next as he's cutting his people out of the world with a mighty cleaver of truth after 1844 to prepare them to enter into the promised land? Right on time in 1863, he gives his dietary prescription, the health message. Does God know what he's doing? Do we want to appreciate it? He's so good to us. He knows exactly what we need. We don't know what we need to stand in the investigative judgment, but Jesus does. He's the judge, <laughs> right? He knows, amen. Okay, so we see justification by faith in 1844, and then God gives his dietary prescription, the health message, intentionally to prepare our minds to be able to receive what he had for us next, in 1888, the commandments of God, the faith of Jesus, the Minneapolis message, the receiving of the law, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. This was the sealing message that God had for his people. He was seeking to prepare us to receive the message of Christ, our righteousness. That message that will swallow up every other. Okay. And then he wanted us to enter into the promised land. Uh-oh. Did it happen? I wonder why. Mm. We're going to take a look real quick. I know the bell rang. We're closing in just a couple minutes here. We're going to take a look real quick. Why does God give a dietary prescription? Good question, right? Exodus chapter 16, verse 4. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you, and the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day. Why? That I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. You're being proven today, brethren. Before the final test comes, you are being proven. Wow. Okay, let's take a look at this. Justification by faith to God's dietary prescription to receiving the law to entering the promised land. Now let me ask you a question. When God went to literal Israel, did he go to every single individual Israelite and say, okay, you know, John, I want you to eat this way and Bill, I want you to eat this way and Roland, I want you to eat this way. Did he do that? No, he rose up a prophet. And he rose up the prophet and he went to the prophet and he told the people, if you read it in context, what to eat, when to eat, and how much to eat. <laughs> That's what he did. It was a message of temperance. What to eat, when to eat, and how much to eat. So would it be in spiritual Israel that God, when giving his dietary prescription, he would not go to each one of us and say, do whatever. He said, I'm going to send you a message that's going to help you understand what to eat, when to eat, and how much to eat. Why? Because I'm seeking to prepare your mind for something very powerful. Because very soon you're going to lighten the world with the glory of God when all the pressure of hell is upon you in the mark of the beast crisis, and you will stand 
You will stand as sentinels. You will stand as my trophies. And my character will be reflected through you. And the whole universe will behold the mighty power of the gospel in the lives of even fallen men. Amen. On the banks of the Jordan, God had his prophet and two messengers, Joshua and Caleb. What did Joshua and Caleb say? We can take it. Now's the time. We can take it. Let's take that mountain. Right? But was everybody faithful? Oh, they were unfaithful spies. Did they war against the message of Joshua and Caleb? Oh, they did. I wonder if the antitype would be the same on the antitypical banks of the Jordan. God had his prophet and two messengers, A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagner. What was the message of Jones and Wagner? We can take it. Now's the time. We can take it. Let me ask you. Were all the spies at that time faithful? Mm. Were there bitterest enemies of that message? Yes. There were, I wonder why. I wonder why some people might be the bitterest enemies of this sealing message. Could it be that they didn't appreciate the preparatory measure that God gave to bring them into a condition to receive it and experience it to finish the work? Let's take a look here. By the way, who, g give me a name or two of some of the bitterest enemies of that message. Butler. Amen. Another one? Smith. Okay, there's good. Those are good. There you go. You got the top two there. Smith and Butler. Let's take a look now. Romans 16, verse 17. This is a principle. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned and avoid them. Why? For they that are such serve not a Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Notice because of their belly, they're contrary to the doctrine. Hmm. And by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. Did Butler and Smith do that? Let's take a look here. Is that the case? This is 1888 Materials 192. G.I. Butler, a testimony to the General Conference President. My brother Butler, you have had too many burdens upon you, but I tell you in love that the Lord has not been pleased with the spirit of warfare you have had on health reform. Had you been a health reformer in deed and truth, please register that, you would have had much better health and escaped many perils. God has given light upon this subject, but you have worked away from the light. And your influence has been opposed to the work that the Lord would do for his people upon this point. You have stood directly in the way of the work of God in health reform. You have suffered sickness because your habits in eating and in labor have not been according to the light which God has given to his people. I am sorry that I have to write in reference to these things as I do. Watch this point. Had you appreciated and heeded the light which the Lord has given us, you would not now be confused in judgment and so enfeebled in nerve and brain power. Why was he confused in judgment and rejecting the message? What's the testimony tell us? He rejected the preparatory measure that God gave beautifully, lovingly, powerfully to him that was foreshown in the atonement anyway to prepare him to stand in Jesus' second coming. Okay. We're going to stop now. Oh. Mm, mm, mm. Time. Mm, time. I'm sorry, saints. I don't want to. I don't want to wear out the patience of the saints, right? I I want to uh, be cognizant of our time. Are we starting to see a couple things here? Is this message vitally important to finishing the work? I want to help you understand something real quick. It's by the blood of sprinkling. Today is by the blood of sprinkling that you can experience anything righteous in your life. The cross made it possible. We have nothing without the cross. Let the cross be the fulcrum of the ages. We have nothing without the cross. But our priest today 
is sprinkling his blood. Boy, when I ask people when I'm doing an evangelistic series, what did Jesus promise he would do when he ascended? I'll come again. Well, what's taking him so long? Why hasn't he come? We don't know. Well, you want to know why? Yeah. Well, let me show you. And then we take time to go through the science of salvation that we might understand the true work of the plan of salvation, that we might understand the timetable as to why Christ had to remain up to a certain time. This work here you can experience through the blood of sprinkling of your personal Savior. That blood will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That blood will give you his mind. That blood will give you victory over any sin you're struggling with at this time. And health reformers and medical missionaries, listen carefully, are to be the most loving, patient, sympathetic, kind, approachable people in the church. Because Jesus is to be living in us in all that we do. And let me tell you, when people take hold of this message, Christ will cut this work short in righteousness. Amen. One promise, then we go. You know this promise. Listen, you may know it by heart, but I'm gonna tell you something. If you meditate on this promise, every time you read it, it's gonna blow your mind. Does the Bible say we can partake of the divine nature and escape the corruption that is in the world through lust? Yes. Okay. Christ Object Lessons 332. The heavenly intelligences will work with a human agent who seeks with what kind of faith? Mm, very important. That perfection of character which will reach out to perfection in action. Why? Because Christ is living in the heart. With every temptation, he makes a way of escape. Unto him who is able to keep you from falling. He's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all you could ask or think. Jesus Christ is not impotent and powerless in the life of a human being when he allows Jesus in the heart, right? Let's take a look here. To everyone engaged in this work, Christ says, I am at your right hand to help you. As the will of man, do you have free will? Yeah. Amen. God does not take away your free will. Free will, he is love. So as your will, as my will, cooperates with the will of God, it becomes omnipotent. Not because of our strength, but because we're receiving and partaking of the divine nature of our Savior because of what he did at the cross and through the blood of sprinkling that now he will have us while having free will, recognize the beauty of him, be so in love with him that we will follow him wherever he leads us, no matter what it is, and we will settle intellectually and spiritually into the truth so that we cannot be moved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. We will settle intellectually and spiritually into an abiding in Jesus so that no matter what temptation comes or what pressure comes, we cannot be moved. Amen. Partaking of the divine nature as a gift of Christ's faith to us. Whatever is to be done at his command may be accomplished in his strength. Amen. All his biddings are enablings. Okay. Thank you, saints. Appreciate the extra time. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, Lord, we're in awe of your character. And we're in awe of your wondrous love for us. We have no hope without you. We have no righteousness of our own. There's nothing we could ever do to merit salvation. We're hopelessly lost without Jesus. We thank you, Father, for your willingness and his willingness for him to come here, put on our flesh, be tempted in all points that we are, and in those temptations, for him to put to death the old man for us and make a way of escape, that we may be able to bear the temptation in receiving the free gift of his faith in the moment 
Lord, we're asking to receive the faith that Christ made in this earth. That beautiful robe of righteousness woven in the heavenly loom. That it may be ours. That our character would be purified for you. And that we would be prepared for his coming. Help us, Lord, to take the message of a crucified and risen Savior to every precious soul you have ordained us to. And please give us your agape love that when people meet us, they will know that we have been with Jesus and they will experience his love flowing through us in rich currents of divine grace and mercy that they will be drawn to our Savior as we point them to him faithfully by your grace. We love you, Lord. Inspire us as to where we're to go from here. Only let us glorify your name, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.